Peace, grace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father, from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to take another look at last Sunday's Gospel lesson, just a part of it. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert where he for 40 days was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those 40 days and at the end of the time he was hungry. Last Sunday you heard the same sermon, the same text, and you heard about stones being turned into bread. And then the pastor made a different analogy. How about when Jesus turned the bread into a sacrament? I thought that was ingenious on his part. Today, however, I'd like to take a different slant on this gospel. Let's fast forward to John's imprisonment when he was asked several times, did you do the right thing? And in order for him to have done the right thing, Jesus had to have been the Messiah. And so he sent word to Jesus, the question, are you the one who was to come? Or shall we look for yet another? And Jesus answered, go and tell John what you see and hear. The deaf are made to hear, the blind to see, the lame to walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then he turned to the followers of John and asked them, why did you go out into the wilderness? What did you hope to see? I'd like to take Jesus' question and turn it around and turn it on Jesus and ask him, why did you, Jesus, go out into the wilderness? Well, our text gives the answer to be tempted of the devil. Now, St. Peter says, Jesus lived his life as an example for you that you should follow in his steps. The question I have is, how closely, how seriously, how much of his example should we follow? Should we also go out into some wilderness for 40 days and fast? Shall we wash the feet of the people who are around us? Shall we leave house and home and go preaching? I did. Pastors do. Jesus, in a sense, was a second career man. For at least 20 years, he was a carpenter, and then he became a preacher. What about our own pastor? For 20 years, he was a Navy man, and now he's a pastor, a preacher. Why don't you do the same thing if you're supposed to follow in his steps? Well, that, of course, is unfair. Well, let's get back to feet washing. Jesus said, I've given you an example. Now the Adventists do this once a year. The Pope does it once a year. One of my friends, a non-denominational, said, well, you know, I do it, and that's what Jesus said to do. And I said, now, buddy, the Bible says Jesus took off his clothes and girded himself with a towel. Do you, well, I don't follow it that closely. <laughs> Well, we get awful selective in how we follow the example of Jesus. What exactly did St. Peter mean when he said he set for you an example? Or what exactly did he say following that same example phrase? He said, no guile was found on Jesus' lips. He committed no sin. When he was reviled, he did not revile back. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he trusted himself to him who judges justly. That's the example. I think of the teachings of Jesus and how he followed his own example. Walk the extra mile. Did he not do that? Turn the other cheek. Did he not do that? Bless those who curse you. Did he not do that? And the answer is yes. Nevertheless, the church for many, many centuries has called upon the faithful to take these 40 days literally and to do some special things. To deny ourselves some pleasure, to take on something, something extra that is spiritually profitable for us. To come out of our comfort zone and prepare ourselves for real meaning when Good Friday comes around as well as Easter. To come out of our comfort zone. If you are retired, you have your comfort zone. There are certain things you do. If you are in the workforce, there are certain things you do. If you're a student, there are certain things you do. Some of the things we do, we do because we like to do them. Some of the things we do, we do because we have to do them. But in the process, it's a routine and we've got kind of 
familiar with it, we got comfortable with it, it's our comfort zone. Now my comfort zone is I enjoy getting up in the morning and making coffee and watching television for about a half hour or so and then either I or Patty will go and make breakfast and then we'll watch it further and I haven't seen enough news until I've seen Stuart Varney tell us exactly what's going on without any political spin or anything else. That's what, that's what the situation is. Well, after that, I do the things as a retired person that I either have to do or want to do. Patty always has a honeydew list for me, so that has to be taken care of. And then I have my hobby with my clocks. If I'm going to preach, then on Mondays I pretty well start writing my sermon, or on Thursdays as the case may be. And then on Saturdays I leave my comfort zone of watching the television. I get ready for Bible class, and on Sunday I get ready for worship. What's your comfort zone? What are the things that you do that you are used to doing that you feel like something is missing if you don't do it? Well, we get ready for worship on Sunday and how comfortable it is to come to our own house of prayer where we meet with our brothers and sisters in Christ and are glad to, you know, you would feel, some of you would feel like fish out of water if you would go to the second service and vice versa from the other people. <laughs> who are these people who are in my church? You have to ask yourself. I know when, when I was uh, at Morristown and, and Pastor was bringing in all these new members, I thought, are these tourists or are these members? I don't know. And how comfortable it is to sing the songs that we like to sing and to recite the liturgy that we know by heart. To be able to say and to do the things that are just so natural for us. But do we really put our heart into it? Or is it just by a rote memory? What did Jesus say about that? This generation honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And that's sad. That's sad because it's a sin. You say it's a sin? Yeah. We're calling on God, Lord have mercy, Christ. No, we're not. We're just saying it. We're just saying it. Our Father who art in heaven, do we really, are we really praying to God Almighty? Or are we just doing the liturgy? Next comes our confession. O most merciful God, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. Are you really sorry for all your sins? Do you really believe that you ought to be punished here, temporal sins, right now? Don't you think that, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm better than most people. Or if he would have done to you what he did to me, you'd have done the same thing. We justify ourselves, do we not? And then this portion, but because of the bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on Question, do you really stop and think about what Jesus went through on Good Friday to earn your salvation, to pay for your sins? The wages of sin is death. Do you, is it just liturgy or do you really mean it? Now, I think there are two things going on in your mind right now. One is you feel uncomfortable. Raise your hands if you're not uncomfortable. Someone once said that it's the pastor's job to afflict the comfortable. And what's the reverse of that? To comfort the afflicted. Yeah? You're feeling uncomfortable because you know I've hit the nail on the head. I've stepped on your toes. Now the second thing is a little bit of self-righteousness. And that's to take that question and throw it back at me. Well, what about you, Pastor? <laughs> Do you always mean the liturgy? Do you always confess your sins? And are you truly sorry for them? You know, the, in the regular reading this morning, if we would have been using the three-year series, we would have read from Jeremiah, where he condemned the people of Israel. What did they do? They tried to kill him. Let me give you an aside. 
39 years ago to this day, this same text, the Jeremiah text, was to be read in the church. And I was following two pastors for more than 40 years who had let the elders, and especially this one family, be the shepherds of the congregation. Now, what is the word shepherd in, in Latin? Pastor. That's where we get the name from. They call all the shots. Pastor, do this. Pastor, go there. And the pastor was their sheepdog. And when I got there, they expected the same from me. Well, if you know me, you know I've never been a sheepdog. <laughs> I don't follow the directions. I, I remember the installation. Will you assist the pastor in the work of his ministry is given to the officers of the church, not to the pastor. Will you follow the directions of the board of elders? Well, this text came up and I read it and the head elder said, you should not have ever read that text during this heated time in our church. I said, you want me to withhold the word of God from the people which bears right on what we're talking about? They said, yes. I said, that makes you awful uncomfortable, doesn't it? And I'm not even preaching it, I'm just reading it. Well, anyway, I'll answer the question. The first one, what do we do about sin? We recognize it and we repent of it. We tell Satan, get thee behind me, because the deceiver, even from the beginning, what he want to do? Take our thoughts away from God and turn it toward ourselves. Oh, most merciful God, what am I going to have for supper this morning? Or for, for breakfast? What are we going to, is the lunch bunch going to meet? What, what's going on afterward? Did I turn the stove off before I left? That's the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> and then for myself, yeah, I have trouble. I have trouble when I sit in the pew because as a former pastor, <laughs> maybe I'd have done that a little better. Maybe I'd have done, boy, that was brilliant. You know, not really thinking of, I'm there to listen and to learn and to praise God, but to think, I don't think I would have put all eight verses of the hymn. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just four. And then when I preach, I'll tell you, with the new liturgies, my mind is so often on, what are we supposed to do next? Remember the old days? The gospel, the, uh, the uh, creed, the sermon hymn, the sermon, the offering, the collection, rather the offertory and then the collection, then the prayers. Now in some of the liturgies, you just, and I'm sitting there, especially when I'm preaching, what am I going to do after this? <laughs> and if I ever get confused when I'm preaching, it's because I'm wondering, what am I, well, what do we do about it? We recognize that Satan is there. And we repent of that. And then there's one more thing. Am I truly sorry for my sins? And the answer is yes. Why? Because Jesus took my sins to the cross. The Bible says, even before you were born, while you were still in your mother's womb, I knew you and I called you by name. Don't you know that Jesus knew each and every one of us and he knew all the sins we committed and he took them to the cross and he reckoned the time when he would finally say, it is finished, finally. I've taken care of you and you and you and you. And that's why he cried out, oh my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So yes, I am sorry for that. And I sincerely repent of that. And when we understand that, we can honestly say, Oh, merciful God, I am poor, miserable sinner. Confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee. I'm not going to justify them. I'm not going to say, Well, everybody's doing it or it's the trend now. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to come into his presence with a true heart. And what helps us to do that? There's a season called Lent. Where the church calls us to come out of our comfort zone. 
to give up some things that are precious to us that we really don't need and to take on some things that will help us spiritually. Extra Bible reading, extra time in prayer, and Lenten services. Yeah. Do you know there was a time when the Lutheran Church, maybe about 60% of us would go to Advent services and almost 100% would go to Lenten services? Why have we changed? Have we gotten so self-righteous or have we gotten so righteous that we don't need Lent anymore? That we don't go, need to follow in the steps of Jesus as he carried his cross to Mount Calvary? As his friends all forsook him, as they nailed him to the cross, as we hear those seven words, and especially the one, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, that was said to everybody, and some laughed when they heard it. When the pastor stands up here and says, when I'm sitting there, I forgive you all your sins, I want to feel it. I don't want to be like that crowd who mocked Jesus or who didn't pay any attention. I really want to feel it. I want to come into church and be a little bit Baptist and say, revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. And what about this one from us? O oh, dearest Jesus, what law hast thou broken that such sharp sentence should on thee be spoken? Of what great crime hast thou to make confession? What dark transgression? Whence come the sorrow? Whence the mortal anguish? It is my sins for which thou, O Lord, must languish. Yea, all the wrath, the woe thou dost inherit, this I do merit. Question, what does R L L L mean? Now I know you don't know it because I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> but years ago I'd always say, what does L L L mean? And you would say, Luther Lehman League. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Lutherans, uh, they are real Lutherans, love Lent because they know they need it. In the appointed gospel lesson for today, Jesus says, O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her checks, but you were unwilling. I believe Jesus is calling us all and saying, I'm calling to gather you together for this service of repentance. Be not unwilling. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.